On April 15, 2019, headlines across the globe were all dominated by one major news story. A massive fire had broken out in the famous Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. As the world watched, the flames quickly swept through the structure, sending its iconic spire crumbling to the ground, caving in the ceiling and setting alight its interior. Everyone who watched the scene and followed the story wondered if anything from the cathedral would even be saved. Why was this such a major news story? The reason is because Notre Dame wasn't just one of the most famous churches in France or even in Europe. It was one of the most prized and celebrated structures in the world. It was unique. But maybe the most unique thing about the cathedral is how long it took to build. Construction on the cathedral began in 1163 at the direction of King Louis VII, and it wasn't finished until the reign of King Philip VI in 1345. Now, I know some of y'all are bad at math, but if you do the math real quick, it took a total of 182 years to build Notre Dame. Not 182 days or weeks or months like we would expect. It took 182 years of planning, building, evaluating, adding, adjusting, planning again, and building some more before the structure was declared finished. This is almost two full centuries. Try to wrap your mind around the amount of time this is. 11 kings of France sat on the throne during the time of its construction. The people who started the work on the cathedral knew they would get nowhere close to seeing it completed during their time on earth. There were craftsmen and artisans who literally spent their entire lives working on this glorious expression of worship to God, knowing they would never be able to fully appreciate it. They hoped their great, 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 great grandchildren would one day admire their work. There were many setbacks along the way, and certainly there were people who doubted if this thing would ever be finished. But in the end, we find that Notre Dame is a study on the value of patience and perseverance. Now, those are not fun words, and actually some of y'all think they're cuss words. They're not, but it's because we live in a fast-paced world. We wanna see results and we wanna see them now. But as we will discover in this session, patience and perseverance have tremendous value in the kingdom of God and are essential for you on this journey of crazy faith. Welcome to session two of Crazy Faith, which means you made it through session one, and that means you are equipped to know how to start in baby faith and know how to stay firm in maybe faith. Today, I want to talk to you about waiting faith. And the truth of the matter is, I hate waiting. Hands up if you like waiting. Put your hands down because nobody likes waiting. I don't like waiting for my food. I don't like waiting for my kids to get ready. And I don't like waiting for my wife on date night. See, my wife, Natalie, she is what you would call um, slow. And she doesn't move with urgency because she knows when she takes her time, it's better. And this applies to her cooking. It applies to date night, it applies to everything, but for some reason, I desire for it to happen fast. But there's always a benefit to the wait. Now, I want you to think about this when we're talking about crazy faith, because I know the things that you are believing God for and the passions that are burning in your heart and the things that you need God to do a miracle on, you wanna see those things now. But many times we need a preparation period to develop the things that God wants in us to prepare for the blessing he has for us. See, the one thing that you need to know is that the gap between what you're believing for and when it actually happens many times is on purpose. It helps you prepare for the promise that he has in store for you. And this is where many people get tripped up because we hate the wait. Yeah, we hate waiting on what God is trying to do, 
how our character needs to be prepared. And this is where I wanna encourage you on your journey. Because if you haven't made it to this place yet, I promise you, you will. You will get to a place where you see where you're supposed to be and you're stuck in this place of it not happening and how you wait will determine how long it takes. There's an Old Testament story that is a warning to all of us that shows us the example of somebody that does not wait on the timing of God. They have the vision right, but the timing wrong. In 1 Samuel 13, we read that while Saul's army is fighting a war against Israel's enemy, the Philistines, the king panics while he was waiting for God to do what he promised. Saul literally is supposed to wait for Samuel to offer a sacrifice and he starts seeing everything around him getting out of hand. But Saul made a false start and Samuel had this to say, you have done a foolish thing. You have not kept the command that the Lord your God gave you. If you had kept that command, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people. Look what it cost Saul, the entire kingdom, because he would not wait on God. My question to you is in this season where things are maybe unstable and it looks like you could just make this happen and go after that opportunity, where is your wait? How do you wait? Will you wait on God? Because the only thing worse than waiting on God is wishing you had waited on God. I'm encouraging you, wait on the Lord. He will renew your strength and allow you to see the promises that he has for you over every pain that you have in waiting. This man literally is a picture to all of us that God's timing is more important than our feelings. And we can listen to our feelings. Feelings are God given and they're indicators. But when you let your feelings lead you, it usually ends up making you forfeit something God had for you. When you're waiting on God, don't let your opinion void your faith. We all have opinions. We all have a way we wish it would happen. But when we trust that God is sovereign and he sees us, he loves us, we can stay in the place that we have been put and we can wait on the Lord. See, when I think about waiting on God, I don't think about just, oh, let me wait on God. I think about waiting on God, being at God's service, saying, God, what can I do? How can I help? Where can I go? Who can I be a blessing to? When you start serving in the wait, it changes your perspective in the wait. And I pray that you can find the ability in the midst of whatever situation you're believing God to show up in in crazy faith, that you wouldn't just have baby faith or maybe faith, but you would be able to live and love and lead in waiting faith. Now, before we go and judge Saul too hard, I think we need to consider that it can be hard to wait on God when we're in a tight spot and it feels like our only option is to take matters into our own hands. It's difficult to exercise waiting faith. Like, that's real to move only when God directs us to move. But I think sometimes it's equally as hard to take action when God says to go. Some of you are at the starting line and God said go a long time ago, but you're not moving because you don't know if it's the right moment. This is especially true when we are in the middle of one of life's storms. We see the winds and the waves around us and we decide, it's probably safer if I just stay right here on the boat instead of obey God's call to come out where it's deeper. Now spend some time in God's word and you'll start to notice that the Bible doesn't highlight many stories of people who play it safe and stay at home and stay comfortable and don't bother. We rarely talk about people who stay safe and dry in the boat. No, we talk about people who trust Jesus enough to get their feet wet and walk 
on the water. We talk about people with what I like to call wavy faith. See, one of the best examples of wavy faith is my guy, Peter. Peter is one of my favorite disciples. He's like the gangster disciple. He'll slice people's ears off and he'll talk crazy and like, kind of like me. And I identify with him a lot because he's not shy about speaking his mind or questioning things. And he deeply desires to be a ride or die follower of Jesus, just like your boy. This is especially true in the story that we find in Matthew 14. Let me set the scene for you. Jesus feeds 5,000. They got tons of leftover. Jesus says, hey y'all, I gotta go pray. He withdraws, but he sends the disciples to the other side of the lake. In the middle of the night, the disciples get caught in a crazy storm. And as they are sailing in this storm, then a figure starts walking towards them. Peter calls out to Jesus, Lord, if it's you, Tell me to come on and walk on the water with you. Jesus says, it's me, come on. So Peter steps out of the boat and walks on the water towards Jesus. Now I want everybody to understand what is happening right here. Cause in the last session, we talked about how chairs hold up people's weight, but the surface of water does not. This is literally a miracle that defies the laws of physics, the laws of gravity, the laws of buoyancy. And Peter is about to step outside of what is comfortable and walk on water or do something in crazy faith. Peter has the audacity to ask Jesus, Lord, is this you? And this unfamiliar situation becomes a little more comfortable because Jesus is in it. And I'm telling you right now, no matter how uncomfortable, how scary, how immaculate your situation seems, if Jesus is in it at all, you can have peace knowing that the one who made the storm, allowed the storm, the one who knows everything about you is in the storm with you. And I need to stop and tell somebody that whatever storm you're in, Jesus is there too. He is in this moment and he wants to speak to you so that you can know what to do. And sometimes what he asks you to do is not just crazy, it's wavy. I think about the 11 other disciples staying on the boat. It seemed logical and safe. After all, boats are built for the express purpose of helping people venture onto water without drowning. I'm sure they all thought Peter was more than a little bit crazy to step out of the boat, what are you doing? But think about this, maybe God was trying to do a miracle for every disciple on that day, not just Peter. The response to Peter asking the question, Lord, if this is you, tell me to come, Jesus only says, come. He doesn't say, come Peter, he just says, come which was an open invitation for every one of the disciples to step out in crazy faith. But only one had the audacity. One had the crazy faith to make that move. Could it have been that God wanted all 12 disciples to walk on water that day? What are you missing out on? Because God is asking you to do something that may seem crazy. Peter is the only person we know of who defied the laws of buoyancy because God wanted to make him the exception. And I came to tell you today that there are things in your life, things going on around you that God is saying, yeah, it never happened for anybody else. You're the exception. Somebody say that right now, I'm the exception. Come on, say it like you mean it, I'm the exception. It may not have happened for anybody else, but I believe this is God calling me to start this business. This is God telling me to go to counseling. This is God telling me to write down this vision. I am the exception. Nobody in my family's been able to do it. Nobody that looks like me's been able to do it. Nobody who's been where I've been has been able to do it, but I am the exception. And God wants to encourage you through Peter's story that you can walk in wavy faith. Though Peter started to sink, he also has something in that moment that nobody else does. He has closer proximity to the one who can save him. Ooh, I love this. See, stepping out of the boat and into the waves 
is actually the safest place Peter can be. Why? Because Jesus is there. Anywhere the Savior is, is the safest place to be. Let me say that again. Anywhere the Savior is, is the safest place to be. I don't care where you are right now. If the Savior is there, you're safe. Even when Peter gets distracted by the storm, allowing fear to consume his faith and beginning to drown, he is in close enough proximity to Jesus to be saved. Without hesitation, Jesus reaches out his hand and pulls Peter out of the water. And I'm telling somebody right now that you may be in a situation where fear has tried to consume you and you feel like you're drowning. All you have to do is call out to the Savior and his hand is there to reach out and grab you. This is my favorite part of the story. When Jesus reached out and grabbed Peter out of the water, he was safe. But then he said something to Peter. He said, you of such little faith, why did you doubt? We were doing the impossible. We were defying all the odds. We were making a miracle happen. And as they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. It's my favorite part because it seemed like the storm was intentional or it was the platform for a miracle that God wanted to do. The disciples literally said, truly, you are the son of God. And I feel like Jesus was like, duh. But at the end of the day, maybe the storm was the platform for one of the greatest miracles that could ever happen. It's not our job to save ourselves. It's our job to trust wholeheartedly in the savior of the world and get close to him. Walking with the savior requires us to step out of what's safe. To be in the waves, it requires us to abide in his timing and to know that the boat may not be the place that God has called us to stay. Step out in wavy faith. When we do, he empowers us to be the exception and to walk on what other people drown in. It's time for you to start living in wavy faith.